So Chung Yi tells this wonderful anecdote. He says that genuine knowledge is different from common knowledge. I once met a farmer who had been mauled by a tiger. I'm glad you chuckled a little bit at that. It took me a long time to get that into the slide, so <laughs> glad that paid off. And then Chung Yi says, someone reported that a tiger had just mauled someone in the area, and everyone present expressed alarm. But the countenance and behavior of the farmer was different from everyone else. Even small children know that tigers can maul people, and yet this is not genuine knowledge. It is only genuine knowledge if it is like that of the farmer. So a little uh, child in grade school knows to say that uh, tigers are dangerous, um, but that's just common knowledge because they don't really understand. And maybe even I, I've seen tigers in the zoo uh, and on television, but I've never been confronted with one, so maybe I just have common knowledge that tigers are dangerous. But the guy who's been mauled by the tiger, when he hears that there's a tiger in the neighborhood, he doesn't just say, ooh, yeah, that's dangerous. He blanches, you know, his, his skin tone changes, and maybe he trembles because this guy really genuinely knows that tigers are dangerous. Now, one of the things I said in the very first lecture was, if a philosopher is obsessing about something and you don't know why they think it's important, you don't understand the philosopher yet. So why is it that Chung Yi is obsessing over this example of genuine knowledge and common knowledge? He goes on to say, and so there are people who know it is wrong to do something and yet they still do it. This is not genuine knowledge. If it were genuine knowledge, they definitely would not do it. The issue that Chung Yi is talking about is much discussed in a variety of different philosophical traditions, including uh, the Anglo-European tradition, where it's known as the problem of weakness of will. And weakness of will is doing something that you know is wrong or failing to do what you know is right. The ancient Greeks discussed it, and they even have a term for it, a special term. They call it akrasia, meaning weakness of will or weakness. And in PPT 1, you read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. We didn't assign book 7, but I hope you kept the book. And if you do, you'll find that there's a really interesting discussion in book 7 of the Nicomachean Ethics of this issue. In your translation, akrasia is rendered incontinence. And Aristotle tries to explain how it's possible that you might know that something is wrong, yet do it anyway. But not all philosophers agree that weakness of will occurs. So also in PPT 1, you read the Mino. And Socrates says in the Mino that people who do wrong do not desire what is bad, but they desire those things that they believe to be good, but that are in fact bad. In other words, it appears that what Socrates thinks is that weakness of will never actually occurs. You don't do what you know to be bad. You do what you believe to be good, but you might be wrong about what is good, and so you do the wrong thing. Now, this is kind of abstract so far, so what's a concrete example? Well, here's a lovely photo of the Yale NUS Fitness Center. Uh, it's not too far from here, as you know. And, and even more importantly, it's not very far from my office. In fact, I pass by it every day when I go home from my office on the way home. And I know that it is good for people to exercise two to three times per week. I know that I will live a healthier life and a longer life if I simply exercise moderately two to three times a week. And I have not been in this fitness center a single time since I got back to Singapore. And I'm probably not going there after this lecture, and I'm probably not going there tomorrow. So here's a case where I know I should be going to the fitness center. I have no good excuse for not going to the fitness center, yet I don't do it. That is weakness of will, or akrasia. And weakness of will presents two problems. One's theoretical and one's practical. The theoretical problem is, how is it possible that people know what is right, yet do what is wrong? What's going on in humans that this even can occur? And once we figure that out, there's the practical issue 
of how can we avoid doing what we know is wrong? How do we avoid weakness of will? How do we get Van Norden in the gym? Now, the readings for this week are taken from readings in later Chinese philosophy. Um, and uh, on the order on the syllabus and the order we recommend you do them in, we've got Zhu Xi selections from the categorized conversations of Master Zhu. We've got some selections from Wang Yang Ming from his work A Record for Practice. Some more Zhu Xi selections from his collected commentaries on the great learning. And then from Wang Yang Ming, some selections from questions on the great learning. And if you do them in that order, will kind of fit together very nicely thematically. So who are these guys? Well, let's start with Zhu Xi. Zhu Xi lived in the 12th century of the Common Era. Many people would say that Zhu Xi is the third most influential, some would say the third greatest, Confucian philosopher in the entire tradition. Obviously, the first one is Kongzi, Confucius himself. Mengzi, whom you read in PPT 1, is often called the second sage of Confucianism meaning he's second in importance only to Confucius himself. And then, at least in terms of influence, I think we'd have to say Zhu Xi is the third most important Confucian philosopher of all time. Why? What did he do? He did a few things. One thing he did is he made the four books, the Su Shu, central to Confucian education. Prior to Zhu Xi, Confucian education was centered around the five classics, the Wu Jing. Uh, but Zhu Xi convinced people that Confucian should at least start their education with the four books. In addition, Zhu Xi wrote commentaries on the four books, the collected commentaries on the four books. And after Zhu Xi's death, the four books, along with Zhu Xi's interpretation of them, became the basis of the civil service examinations in China and remained so for centuries. And so generations of Chinese intellectuals literally committed to memory all of the four books and all of Zhu Xi's commentaries on them. And when I say that they literally committed to memory all of the four books and all of Zhu Xi's commentaries on them, you think I mean they memorized a lot of them. I do not mean that. I mean they literally could recite from memory all the four books from the beginning to the end, and all of Zhu Xi's commentaries on them from memory, so they could regurgitate them on the civil service examinations. And you cared about those examinations because that was how you got a government position. And from a government position, you had prestige, you had power, and most of all, you had money. So P Zhu Xi's had this huge influence because of this, and he continues to have an influence even to this day. Many people find it hard to believe the Zhu Xi's interpretations of the classics could even be wrong. I spent most of my career arguing with those people, because I love Zhu Xi, but I do think he's wrong about some things. So what did Zhu Xi say in these commentaries? He explained the four classics in terms of a metaphysics of pattern and qi. And so he applied this fundamental metaphysics to all these classic texts. Now, in the first lecture, uh, I mentioned metaphysics, and I said that philosophers use the term metaphysics in different ways. But one way of thinking about metaphysics is that it addresses the question, what are the most fundamental kinds of things that exist, and how are those things related to each other? And you are all metaphysicians, whether you know it or not. You might think you're not. You might say, well, I'm a science major. I don't believe in this metaphysics stuff. I just, I believe that, you know, what exists are atoms and molecules and the things that physics and chemistry and biology tells us about. That's a metaphysical view. That's physicalism or naturalism. The view that all that exists is what's described by physics or all that exists is what's described by natural science. It's a metaphysical view. I personally think it's a really naive metaphysical view, but, you know, we can have that argument in my office hours. But you are a metaphysician whether you like it or not. So what's Zhu Xi's metaphysics? Zhu Xi says everything that exists is a composite of pattern, in Chinese li, and qi. Uh, qi doesn't have a good translation in English. People have tried translations. Qi has been translated as ether, psychophysical stuff, and other things. But those aren't really translations. So we just romanize it in our translation. And pattern is the structure of the universe. And according to Zhu Xi, this pattern, this structure of the universe, 
is completely present in each and everything that exists. It's fully present in each and everything that exists. But then the pattern gets instantiated in the chi, and the chi is the spatio-temporal stuff that makes up individual objects. So the pattern's the same in everything, but it gets converted into particular kinds of things and particular individuals by the chi that it gets refracted through. That's a little abstract. Let's look at a concrete example. I wish that picture was a little clearer. Uh, this is my dog, Diego. He's very adorable. He's a French bulldog. This is his girlfriend, Aria. She's a miniature pincher who lives next door. So according to Zhu Xi, what's going on here? According to Zhu Xi, what's going on is that the pattern of the universe is completely present in Diego. And the pattern of the universe is completely present in Aria. And the, the pattern of the universe is even present in this red lawn chair that they're both underneath. So why do there appear to be three different things here, two dogs and one lawn chair? because the chi in the lawn chair and in Aria and in Diego is different. And so the chi is what makes things be individuals. On top of that, the chi of the lawn chair is very dense, very turbid. And because of that, very little of the universal pattern manifests itself in the lawn chair. The chi in Diego and Aria is less dense, less turbid. And so they have a more active repertoire of ways of interacting with their environment and understanding their environment. And the chi in you and me is even less dense, more clear. And so we're, we manifest even more of the pattern and can have a deeper understanding of the pattern. Right? By the way, they're both very cute, but as you can see from the expression on Aria's face, Diego is much more into Aria than Aria is into Diego, unfortunately. So it's just kind of an honor, honorific that we refer to her as his girlfriend. She's just not into him. Now, let's remember that question I keep asking, why does a philosopher care about this metaphysical issue? Because you don't understand the philosopher until you know why this issue bugs them. Well, Wang Yangming, the other guy that we're going to be reading, gives an explanation for why it's important to understand this metaphysics. Wang Yangming says, great people, regard heaven, earth, and the myriad creatures as their own bodies. They look upon the world as one family and China as one person within it. Why do they do that? Why do great people look upon everything as one? Because everything shares the same pattern. So we are all part of a potentially harmonious whole because we share one pattern. Wang goes on to say, those who, because of the space between their own physical form and those of others, regard themselves as separate from heaven, earth, and the myriad creatures are petty persons. So if you regard yourself as fundamentally distinct from me, just because there's a space between your body and my body, Wang says, you're a petty person who doesn't understand the true metaphysical nature of the universe, which is one in which we all have a shared pattern. So what does Jushi do with this metaphysics? He uses it to explain the four books. So these are the four books, the Analects, the Great Learning, the Mean, and the Mengza. And among contemporary scholars, both in the West and also in East Asia, there's a lot of debate about the composition and origin of these works. But Jushi had a view about the origin of these works that gave them a very special pedigree. So I'm not going to talk about what the contemporary debates are about the origins of these works, but let's just look at what Zhu Xi thought was how they came about. The Analects is the sayings and brief dialogues of Kongzi, that is Confucius, and his immediate disciples. And Zhu Xi thought it was composed pretty soon after the death of Kongzi and was a pretty accurate account of what Kongzi said and did. The great learning which we're reading next week, is supposedly an opening statement by Kongzi, the classic section, with a commentary on it by his disciple Zhengzi, Master Zheng. Then the mean is a discussion of ethics and metaphysics that is supposedly by Zisi. And who was Zisi? Zisi was Kongzi's grandson, but also a disciple of Zhengzi, who was 
the guy who wrote the commentary section in The Great Learning, who was an immediate disciple of the master, Kung, Kungza himself. And then Mengzi, which you read in PPT 1, the sayings and dialogues of Mengzi, also known in English as Mencius, who was himself a disciple of Zizi. So if this account is right, you can see why he thought these four works were really important. They've got this nice genealogy going all the way back to the master and his immediate disciples and his grandson, who was also a disciple of a disciple, and then this guy who was a disciple of a disciple of a disciple. So it's got a nice pedigree. So we're having you look at the great learning with a classic section attributed to Kungza and the commentary attributed to his disciple Zhangzi. And then you're also looking at Zhu Xi's commentary on both works. How does it start out? The text of the great learning begins, the way of great learning lies in enlightening one's enlightened virtue. Cool line, but what does it mean? It was not clear to most of Zhu Xi's contemporaries what it meant any more than it's clear to us. That's why I wrote the commentary. Let's start with the phrase great learning. Zhu Xi explains in his commentary, great learning is the learning of an adult. So Jushi envisions that in ancient times you had the schools of lesser learning, the Xiaoxue. And students, uh, and in fairness, he thought it was uh, male students. There were women in traditional uh, China who were very well educated, very well read. Some of them uh, wrote works of their own. Uh, but in fairness, they were usually denied education. And when they were educated, it was often with the idea that, well, they're going to learn to read so they can help teach the children to read and help the children with their homework. But there were some women who had uh, very significant intellectual uh, contributions. But in any case, Zhu Xi envisioned that in the lesser learning, males up at about the age of eight would go to school and they would learn practical skills like reading and arithmetic. There was phys physical education in the form of learning archery and charioteering. Uh, there was music education, education in ritual and etiquette. And the idea was that these things were not just practical skills, although they were that. They were also ways of training and stabilizing your chi. So like settling your chi by giving you things that would add pattern and structure to your life and rhythm to your life. And you learned how you should behave as an adult. And you internalized a kind of order which helped to clarify your chi a little bit and make the pattern shine through a little bit better. Then, at the age of 15 or so, the most talented students would go on to the great learning, the dashue. And the great learning was where you learned what the pattern is. So in the lesser learning, you're trained to follow the pattern. In the great learning, you learn what the pattern itself is. So Jushi thinks that the, the book, the great learning, is in a way like the syllabus for these schools of great learning in ancient times. So that's the kind of work it is. What does he mean by enlightened virtue? Jushi explains, enlightened virtue contains the entire pattern so that it can respond to the myriad kinds of situations. However, it is darkened due to the restrictions caused by our endowments of chi and the obscurations of human desires. In other words, you have within you from birth the complete pattern of the universe which is both a physical guide to the structure of the universe, but also a moral guide to how things ought to be. Well, if you've got that inside you, why do you need to study anything? You've got the answer completely inside you. Some Confucians said, well, I guess you don't need to study. You just have the answer already inside you. But Zhu Xi said, no, you've got the answer inside you. But for most of us, our qi, is so turbid, so obscured, that we can't see the pattern inside ourselves fully without the help of the classic texts and the guidance of sages. So we've got the enlightened virtue, which is just the entire pattern within ourselves, but for most of us it's obscured because our chi is so darn turbid. So what are we supposed to do about that? Well, we enlighten our enlightened virtue. And what that means is, the enlightenment of virtue's fundamental substance is never extinguished. So it's always there, even though it's covered by turbid chi. 
Hence, learners should follow its manifestations and thereupon enlighten it in order to return to its beginnings. What's that supposed to be like? Well, think back to PPT 1 and the story of King Xuan of Qi. And Mengzi met this king, and he asked the king, I hear that your majesty spared an ox being led to slaughter because you felt sorry for it. And you said that it was like an innocent person going to the execution ground. Did that really happen? And the king said, oh, yeah, that happened. And Mengzi says, well, it's great that you had this compassion. This shows that you've got compassion in your heart. But how about taking this compassion you're showing for the ox being led to slaughter and showing it to your own subjects who are likewise being led to slaughter by your bad government policies and your wars of conquest and your excessive taxation used to fund your own luxuries and those of your followers. So that's an example of starting with the manifestations of the pattern you already have. The king sees that he should feel sorry for the ox being led to slaughter and then extending it to other parts, enlightening other parts of the pattern, so coming to see that you should also have compassion for your subjects. So just in this one line, Jushi thinks we have a microcosm of what the work's about and what education is about. One metaphor that Jushi likes to use a lot to explain what the pattern's like and what you have to do with it is he says the pattern is like a beautiful jewel a beautiful gleaming jewel in mud. The pattern is the beautiful jewel. The mud is your chi before you've cultivated yourself. Now, I used to really be into aquariums. Uh, and if you have an aquarium, you learn pretty quickly that if you don't keep the filters running or if you don't change the water uh, because the, the fish uh, poop, uh, in there, and they, they don't always eat all the food you leave for them, and that tends to rot, and so algae builds up. And so this is what a, an aquarium looks like pretty quickly uh, if you don't keep the filters working or if you don't change the water. But if you, keep, if you get the filters working or if you change the water, it gets nice and clear like this. So notice here you can barely see anything in the tank. Here you can see everything. This on the left is what the chi is like in most of us where it's turbid and cloudy and you can't see the pattern. The object of ethical cultivation is to clarify your chi so that you can see the pattern within yourself. And how do you do that? Two steps, lesser learning and greater learning. The lesser learning, basic skills like calligraphy and arithmetic, physical education like charioteering and archery, the arts, music and ritual, uh, Jushi also thought that meditation was important. Um, but seated meditation, you know, I, he doesn't, I think he would think of it as more a form of the lesser learning. It's a way of calming yourself down, calming the chi, so that you can then engage in the greater learning. And the great learning includes reading the classics, in this case, the four books, discussing the classics, and composing essays and poetry about what you have learned. Does that sound familiar? You go someplace with teachers, and you read the classics, and then you discuss the things that you've read, and then you write essays and, well, not poetry. Maybe we should have you write poetry. But we have you write essays about the things you've written, right? That's what we're doing at Yale NUS. That's a whole liberal arts education. And the word for great learning in Chinese is da xue. The word for university in modern Chinese is da xue. That's precisely why. So this, in a nutshell, is Zhu Xi's version of education. Well, what about the problem we started out with, the Cheng Yi raised, about, well, some people seem like they know what they should do, but they don't do it. How is that possible, and how can we fix doing that? How can we get Van Norden to the gym, for God's sakes? Um, that, to explain this, Jushi talks about this passage, which is in the commentary section, in other words, the part attributed to Zhengzi, Master Zheng. And this is one of my favorite passages in all of Chinese philosophy. And when you see what's going on in it, it's really cool. So the passage in the original text says, what is meant by making thoughts have sincerity is to let there be no self-deception 
It is like hating a hateful odor or loving a lovely sight. This is called not being conflicted. Okay, what is like hating a hateful odor or loving a lovely sight? Jushi explains. He says, this verse means that those who desire to cultivate themselves must make their hatred of evil be like their hating a hateful odor and their love of the good be like their loving a lovely sight. I love this simile. I think this is utterly brilliant and fascinating. What does it mean? Take it one bit at a time. Those who desire to cultivate themselves must make their hatred of evil be like they're hating a hateful odor. Um, this example I like to use, it works well with, better with some crowds than others. I think as college students, it might work with you. We'll see if it works. But have you ever had the experience of like you want some coffee in the morning and you go into your refrigerator because you want some, some kind of dairy product in your coffee. You want some cream or some half and half or some milk. You go in the refrigerator, you pull the, the milk out or the half and half, you smell it. Oh my God, it's God bad. That's chunky. That is some chunky cream. That's really bad. That's really disgusting. If you have this experience, you don't smell the gross, disgusting, curdled, chunky milk and go like, oh, that's really, that's really gone bad. Maybe I should put it in my coffee anyway. You know what? Maybe I'll just pour a glass of this and just drink it. You know, maybe I'll just put it on my cereal. No, that doesn't happen. Why? Because it's disgusting. It smells disgusting. So you're not going to put it, you're not going to eat it, you're not going to put it in your food. It's gross. In other words, we should learn to hate evil as spontaneously and viscerally as we are revolted by disgusting odors. You should learn to hate evil with the same level of revulsion that you are revolted by a bad smell. You're not tempted to put the curdled milk in your coffee you shouldn't be tempted to do the wrong thing. Clever simile. What about the other side, though? And for a long time, this really puzzled me. How on earth is loving a lovely sight parallel to hating a hateful odor? Now, the term in Chinese is su, which in classical Chinese as a modern si Chinese can mean color, like yan su in modern Chinese. But is that what it is? You should hate evil like it's a disgusting odor and love the good like a pretty shade of blue. Right? That's, that's all. Yeah, exactly. That's weird, right? Then I figured out what was going on. And a lot of people who have PhDs in Chinese philosophy don't know this. So you're getting your money's worth today. You're going to know something a lot of experts don't know. Jushi explains what's going on. In talking about what kind of sight are we talking about here, Jushi says, Loving a lovely sight and hating a hateful odor are sincerity. Loving virtue like one loves physical beauty, this is to sincerely love virtue. However, people are seldom able to do this. And one of the meanings su can have in classical Chinese is it can refer to lust or the person or thing that is the object of your lust, of your erotic desire. So, What's going on here, and in a moment, I'm going to show a slide of a Renaissance artwork that has some nudity in it. If for religious or personal re reasons you don't want to view that, I'll tell you when I'm going to click, and you can close your eyes, and I'll tell you when the slide's gone. But I'm just warning you it's coming up. So how is loving a lovely sight parallel to hating a hateful odor? Here comes the slide. It's not about loving a pretty rainbow or a nice shade of blue. It's about being attracted to someone or something that you find erotically charged, that you're attracted to in an erotic or sexual way. Uh, this is an exquisite painting by Bronzino, Venus, Cupid, Folly, and Time, from the Renaissance. A lot of discussion about what it means, but it's clearly, it's a, in some ways, it's, it's about erotic attraction and how that's a, a metaphor for uh, the love of the good. Okay, slide's gone. So that's what loving a lovely sight means. So in other words, hating evil like hating a hateful odor and loving goodness like loving a lovely sight means ethical perception and motivation should be inseparable. When we hate a bad odor, our perception of it as foul, as disgusting, 
is inseparable from our revulsion, which motivates us to avoid it. Likewise, when you realize something is bad or evil, you should be revolted by it so that you're not even tempted to do it. Likewise, when we love a lovely sight, our perception of it as appealing is inseparable from our attraction, which motivates us to be drawn toward it. Likewise, we should love the good in a way so that as soon as we perceive it as good, we are drawn to it spontaneously and unreservedly. And if we achieve that, we will not have weakness of will. If I could learn to love going to the gym as if I were erotically attracted to the gym, I would have no problem going to the gym. So really for Zhu Xi, there's a two-step process of ethical cultivation. He says those who desire to cultivate themselves when they know to do good in order to avoid the bad. So first step is you study the greater learning and you learn this is what is good. This is what is bad. But knowing is not enough. The next step is you must then genuinely make an effort and forbid self-deception making their hatred of evil be like they're hating a hateful odor and they're loving what is good like they're loving a lovely sight. In other words, when I'm on my way home and I'm going to go past the gym and I know I should exercise, I should not tell myself things like, you know what, this was a really hard, long day. I'm allowed to skip today. Or, you know what, I bet I'd have a better workout if I went tomorrow morning when I have more energy instead of going right now. Because I know full well I'm not going tomorrow morning either. Right? But you engage in self-deception. You hide the moral knowledge from yourself by not focusing on it. And for Zhu Xi, that's how weakness of will occurs. And so what you have to do is work at focusing on your ethical knowledge to make your love of the good like loving a lovely sight and your hatred of evil like hating a bad odor. So in terms of knowledge and action, Zhu Xi says, if we discuss them in terms of their sequence, knowledge comes first. But if we discuss them in terms of their importance, action is what is important. When people know something, but their actions don't accord with it, their knowledge is still shallow. So Zhu Xi believes in the possibility of weakness of will, and he explains it in terms a lot like Cheng Yi did. There's kind of a shallow knowledge, which Cheng Yi called common knowledge, and then there's deeper knowledge, which Cheng Yi referred to as genuine knowledge. And the way you achieve that is by focusing on what the knowledge you have until it becomes uh, like loving a lovely sight or hating a hateful odor. Wang Yangming thinks this is completely wrong. Wang Yangming lived a few centuries after Zhu Xi, and by the time Wang Yangming came along, Zhu Xi's ideas had become orthodoxy. They'd become the standard answers you memorize for the civil service examinations. So people would memorize them and just regurgitate them on the exams without really thinking about them. Um, this is uh, from the New York Times. This is a photograph of robot Wang Yangming. And this is actually paid for by the Chinese government. It's a robotic a statue of Wang Yangming that will actually write calligraphy in the style of Wang Yangming. Why is the Chinese government so into Wang Yangming? Because President Xi Jinping said that his favorite non-Marxist philosopher was Wang Yangming. And what Wang Yangming is most known for is his critiques of Zhu Xi and his insistence on the unity of knowing and acting. So what does that amount to? Well, in a record for practice, Wang uh, is, is records a conversation where Wang is advocated the unity of knowing and acting, and one of his disciples says, Master, so I'm trying to understand your doctrine of the unity of knowing and acting, but it seems to me like it's got to be wrong. And so Wang says, well, could you explain to me how you think knowing and acting are not a unity? And the disciple says, well, for example, there are people who know they should show filial piety or they know they should show respect for their elder siblings, but they don't do it. Wong will have none of it. Wong says, there never have been people who know but do not act. Those who know but do not act 
simply do not yet know. Thus, the great learning gives us examples of true knowing and acting, saying it is like loving a lovely sight or hating a hateful odor. Seeing a lovely sight is a case of knowing, while loving a lovely sight is a case of acting. As soon as one sees that lovely sight, one naturally loves it. It is not as if you first see it, and only then intentionally you decide to love it. So Wong is using the same examples from the great learning, but whereas Ju Xi says, yeah, loving the good like loving a lovely sight, hating evil like you hate a hateful odor, that's the ultimate goal of ethical cultivation. You start by knowing what's right and wrong, and you end by loving the good and hating evil. Wong says, no, that's not the point of the great learning at all. The great learning is telling you what ethical knowledge is like from the very beginning. To know the good is to love the good. To know evil is to hate it. And he, he says, but then the disciple says, yeah, but there are people who say they know they should have filial piety, and they say they know they should respect their elder siblings, but they don't do it. And Wong says, well, look, consider the case of a person with a stuffed up nose. Even if he sees a malodorous object right in front of him, the smell does not reach him, and so he does not hate it. This is simply not to know the hateful odor. So it's like, you know, if you tell me the milk is curdled, and all I have to go on is smell, but I've got a head cold, so I can't smell it. And you say, here, and you say, here try this, uh, this milk, and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's horrible, it smells bad. I don't know it smells bad. I know you tell me it smells bad, but if my nose is stuffed up, I don't know that it smells bad. I'm not revolted by it. I might even drink it. I only know it's bad if I can smell that it's bad. The same is true when one says that someone knows filial piety or brotherly respect. That person must already have acted with filial piety or brotherly respect before one can say he knows them. What's Van Orden's question always? Why does the philosopher care about this so much? Wong tells us why he cares about this so much. He says, people today separate knowing and acting into two distinct tasks to perform and think that one must first know and only then can one act. They say, now I will perform the task of knowing by studying and learning. Once I have attained real knowledge, I then will pursue the task of acting. And so, till the end of their days, they never act. Until the end of their days, they never know. Interesting footnote to this, I have a very brilliant colleague at UC Riverside, Eric Fitzgable. And Eric has actually done some empirical research on the question of whether taking ethics courses in philosophy departments or teaching ethics in philosophy departments makes you a better person. And he's the first to admit that it's hard to get good empirical evidence on this. Right? But all the studies he's done so far suggest there is zero correlation between either teaching ethics or studying ethics and being an ethical person. And Eric and I have a, a friendly disagreement on this issue because Eric's inclined to think it shows that, well, so you can't teach people how to be a better person. Wang Young Ming and I would disagree. We'd say what it shows is that the way we teach ethics in contemporary colleges and universities can't make you a better person. But there are other ways of teaching ethics, like the ways the Confucians, like Wang Yang Ming used, that would be successful. So it's still a very live issue. So let's summarize where we've been. Zhu and Wang agree about a lot. right? So Zhu Xi and Wang Yang Ming agree about a lot. They agree that when we fully cultivate our virtues, it, we, will love the good, we will hate evil like hating a hateful odor, and we will love the good like loving a lovely sight. They agree with that. They agree that we should be repulsed by evil as spontaneously and unreservedly as we are disgusted by the smell of spoiled milk. They agree that our love of goodness should be as spontaneously motivating as our attraction to someone we find erotically appealing. Where do they disagree? Zhu and Wang disagree in that for Zhu Xi, knowledge of good and evil does not necessarily motivate correct action. 
Loving the good like loving a lovely sight and hating evil like hating a hateful odor are accomplishments, the end result of a long process of cultivation. Whereas Wang Yang Ming believes in the unity of knowing and acting. Knowledge of good and evil necessarily motivates correct action. To know the good is already to love it like loving a lovely sight. To know the bad is already to hate it like hating a hateful odor. I'm going to conclude with a little bit of advice from Zhu Xi. Now, as I say, Zhu Xi's views became orthodoxy, and they became the kind of thing you just memorized and then just reproduced on an examination. And that's ironic, because if you read Zhu Xi, one of the things he says is he says explicitly, so I've written these commentaries for you. Whatever you do, don't just read my commentaries. You should read other people's commentaries, too, so that you can weigh for yourself what the true pattern is underlying the text. And if you read a bunch of different perspectives and you think about it, the pattern will become clear to you because the pattern ultimately is inside you. And Jushi argued and with other philosophers and he discussed things with his students and Wang Yang Ming did too, but ironically his thought became this stifling orthodoxy which is the last thing he would have wanted. And we can see that if we look at this advice he gave students in his era. Zhu Xi said, there is a sort of talk among the current generation that encourages laziness. People say things like, I would not dare to carelessly criticize my elders. Or, I would not dare to assert my own uninformed opinions. These are simply expressions of laziness. Those who don't have opinions simply have not read carefully enough to have any doubts. So my recommendation to you as you go into the next week of PPT is carelessly criticize your elders. Assert your own uninformed opinions. It will make Jushi proud. Thank you. Thank you.